we've um, been focusing on uh, the work that we do with our client countries and with our private sector clients outside of the convention, which shows that there is a pathway forward. Um, and we're trying to uh, highlight where um, specific actions can have the maximum impact. So uh, obviously as a development bank we're very uh, involved in mobilising uh, development finance that can invest in a low carbon future and a resilient future. We're involved in uh, dispersing and managing uh, climate finance as well. But we're focused on getting the prices right getting the finance flowing and working where it matters most. So that's carbon prices, it's getting rid of fossil fuel subsidies and it's about working in the cities and trying to build climate smart agriculture. Um, obviously on the first day of these talks, um, Typhoon Haiyan uh, was a big story um, and it's caused devastation. A lot of people calling for loss and damage are just, uh, or mechanism on loss, loss and damage. I believe you have a report out on that today? Yeah, we just released a report called Building Resilience uh, and this is a report that looks at all of our experience uh, in the World Bank Group in investing in resilience and preparedness um, rather than just in financing uh, relief. Um, and as we see uh, the losses, economic losses and the loss of life uh, increasing as a result of uh, a pattern of intensity of extreme weather events and if one looks at what climate science is saying is going to continue for years to the future we expect the losses and damages as a result of climate change to start cl to, to continue climbing and perhaps climb quite steeply into the future and so it's really important that negotiators and really important that delegates here understand all of the lessons learned about how to minimize um, uh, the, uh, the, the risks of loss and damage and how to invest in resilience through development finance but also now in mobilising climate finance for that end. Can you give us some figures on how much we might need to spend in future? Um, I can't project the future but we can look back in the past and we can see that um, since the 1980s um, so since the world coined the phrase sustainable development, um, the losses as a result of extreme weather events have quadrupled. So we're, you know, this is a sizable um, uh, increase in, in, in disasters. We can also look at individual disasters and, uh, and their rep repetition. So if you look at Odisha, the east coast of India, that experienced a Category 5 typhoon similar to that experienced by Philippines last week, when that last size of typhoon hit Odisha over 10 years ago in 1999, 10,000 people died and the losses ran into the hundreds of millions of dollars. Uh, 10 years later, uh, after, the, after India had in, uh, invested massively, with help from us and others, in greater resilience for the population and for infrastructure, the losses were still high because that part of India is developed, but the loss of life went down from 10,000 to 38. So we can show you back, trends looking backwards, but we can also show you what investments actually make the greatest difference. And is compensation also something that um, the, the report looked at or something that countries might have to consider? No, compensation I think is, is, is a dynamic within the climate discussions, that's not something that we've commented on. What we wanted to show is that there are things that countries can do and that they can do now that will prepare them better for the future. We, we can show that for every dollar invested in resilience, you can save four dollars in relief if something were to happen. We can show you that for a dollar invested in early warning, you can save up to thirty-five dollars in relief. And while that conversation around compensation is going on, while that discussion is going on around loss and damage, we wanted to put some evidence base in front of delegates so that they could see what we're really what we're really experiencing and what countries are already trying to invest in. And do you think any mechanism that comes out of these talks will be able to provide some of um, that resilience? Well, I think the only way that we're going to really build resilience uh, in, in all of our countries, because, you know, storms hit New York, storms hit the Philippines, storms uh, hit, hit the Caribbean, is that we will have to use um, specific resources around uh, disasters and the relief efforts where the generous public of many countries, you know, cut an individual check or send in a text on a cell phone that gives money. We will have to mobilize climate financing and we'll also have to make sure that all development financing into developing countries has disaster resilience built into it. We can't be affording to spend development money that's not looking at how to make make road systems, uh, schools, um, uh, hospitals and public buildings disaster resilient. We're going to have to do that. 
What about fossil fuel subsidies? You mentioned at the start that you'd like to see those scrapped. Um, why aren't we getting on with it? Because in, uh, that's, that's correct. While we're talking about raising $100 billion for 2020 uh, every year and then looking at long-term financing options under the convention, um, at the same time, we are uh, you know, investing enormous amounts of money in policy decisions which are working against that. Fossil fuel subsidies, harmful fossil fuel subsidies being one of the most egregious examples. Um, and the reason why this isn't moving faster than I think we would all wish is that in each country that's an intensely political decision. Um, those subsidies were put in place, perhaps wrongly, for a reason. It was to, uh, it was to protect often portions of the population from price shocks. Trying to explain and show that different policy measures might have a better effect in terms of protecting the poor and protecting the environment it is something that requires political leadership. It requires, you know, a stable, electable majority. I mean, these are things that each government has to assess. So we can put the evidence and the data in front of the government. We can also work with them to make sure that their social safety net is strong enough to make sure that the poor do not suffer if they were to remove that subsidy and put a different public policy instrument in place. Um, but at the end of the day, that's a political decision and that depends on, on the leadership and the, and the capability of each government. The World Bank has been um, criticised at these talks. People are unhappy about the World Bank taking um, charge of uh, the Green Climate Fund, for example. Um, how do you think, though, uh, that, those tr that track of the talks is going? Well, we're not in charge of the Green Climate Fund, and I think there's a misunderstanding. We act as the trustee, which means that we use our um, fiduciary responsibility. We're a bank, and so and we're a AAA rated, so we, we are a robust financial institution uh, separate from our own lending policies. So that sort of financial infrastructure has been used to act as a trustee in order to support the Secretariat. Um, but I think, uh, setting that to one side, the finance conversations are um, experiencing a lull, right? We're, we're, we're talking about extreme weather. Um, I think we have a lull in, in the finance discussions in that there's pent up frustration on the developing country side that there should be more finance flowing. I think there is finance flowing, but we've got to, and together with others, show how that finance is flowing. Um, but you know, we are, whether we like it or not, in a very particular part of an economic cycle in the developed world. and it's very difficult for that finance to flow at greater levels yet. Um, the final thing I would say is that when you go outside of the convention um, and you're working in, in developing countries and emerging economies and middle-income countries, most of the conversation in, in the world of development but also in the world of sustainable development and climate resilience, and disaster resilience, is about how to ensure that all forms of finance coming into the country are working for the objectives that the government has set. So foreign direct investment, the mobilisation of domestic resources, overseas development assistance and climate finance. And I think that here inside the convention negotiations, people are concerned and worried and perturbed at the role that private finance might play. They don't want that to displace the public commitment that must be made by Annex One countries. But I think that we and others can show that you can use public finance which must be pledged, it's part of the honour-bound commitment of the Convention, but you can use public finance to crowd in or to mobilise other forms of private finance and that you don't, it's not a trade-off, you don't have to have one or the other, you can use one to leverage the other. What about coal? Um, obviously it's a big issue at this conference and the World Bank has been criticised for continuing to invest in coal, when uh, uh, unabated coal, when uh, scientists warn that that will mean going over two degrees. Yeah, so in July of this year, we, um, our board approved a new energy directions paper uh, that has the triple goals of um, securing access to energy for all, um, uh, increasing energy efficiency and inc increasing the amount of renewables in the energy mix. And as a result of that policy, we have now stipulated that we will only invest in coal in extremely rare circumstances. And those extremely rare circumstances are a, a least developed, uh, a very poor country that has uh, a commitment to energy diversification, but uh, realistically within the next 10 to 15 years is not going to be able to get there without some use of coal. And that if we were to finance any new coal, uh, power, coal power generation, we would do so in a way that it was to the highest standards of efficiency. Um, I think the, the only point that I would make is one of materiality. 
even if we were to connect the 1.3 billion people today who are poor and who have no access to energy, and you need energy in order to have jobs, in order to grow, in order to be competitive as an economy, even if we connected those 1.3 billion to power today, and that power will fossil fueled, that would be less than 1% of global emissions. So we can't take our eye off the ball. Our eye has to stay firmly fixed on the efficiency of the energy systems of those countries that are already developing and growing fast. Um, yes, we have to. Uh, we, we don't want to condemn developing countries to a path of fossil fuel intensity, which we're trying to move away from. But that's not where the big emissions problem is. Where is the big emissions pro problem in India and China? The big emissions problem is in the largest emitters, and that's the United States, Europe. China, Japan, and, and the fast-growing countries. And the intensity of carbon in their portfolios, in their energy systems, is something which must be of deep competitive concern um, within, within the planning horizon. This is not something that most people must worry about for 2050. This is something that is now becoming a material concern for economic planning over the next 10 to 20 years.